Our next presenter is Jake Klein, founder and executive chairman of Evolution Mining. What's that? <laughs> Over the past, it's all good. Over the past decade, Jake has led the growth of Evolution into one of the world's leading globally relevant gold miners with assets in, here in WA, New South Wales, Queensland and Ontario, Canada. Having had to deliver his presentation virtually from Sydney last year, we're very pleased to welcome Jake back to the stage. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Duncan. Oh, how do I go back? Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to our investor relations team, uh, Martin Cummings, Donna Lesk, Liesl Kemp, and Michael Vaughan for putting uh, the slide pack together. It's not easy putting a slide like that together. Um, but after three long years, it is great to be back here in person. Thank you, Western Australia, for letting us back in. Thank you, Diggers, for inviting us back. Um, so much has changed over these times. Many of us, including myself, uh, feel blindsided by the recent rapid change. But I think on reflection, with the benefit of hindsight, much of it now looks reasonably obvious and predictable. The last 12 months have been tough to be a gold investor or a gold miner. Dispirited investors appear to have abandoned all hope. But my view is that the game is far from over. As I sat here this morning through a number of presentations of gold companies, it did strike me uh, that none of us spoke about the gold price. So I'm going to start my presentation on that because I want to start with a big and bold prediction. And that is that the gold price will be materially higher when, I stand, when I'm standing here in 12 months' time than it is today. But please just don't ask me by how much. I also think when we look back, this outcome will also be reasonably obvious and predictable. So let me try and explain why. Since the early 1980s, global economies have experienced incredible prosperity. Globalization opened up new cheap labor supply, Technology advances resulted in higher productivity, and a debt super cycle kept the consumer happy. Every time the economy slowed, central banks were able to pivot and reduce rates quickly to support growth. And I love this slide. This has been even more the case since the 2008 financial crisis when inflation cratered and allowed central banks to turbocharge monetary policy, cut interest rates to negative levels, and pump unlimited money into the system. COVID and the monetary and fiscal stimulus that followed only exacerbated this. A few weeks ago, we learned that inflation in the United States is running at over 9%, the highest level since 1981. And that's after the Fed has already hiked interest rates four times. Last week, Australian data showed our inflation rate at 30-year highs. That's after three rate rises of our own since May. Yet unemployment in the US, like in Australia, is at historic lows. McDonald's is paying a $1,000 sign-on bonus to get staff in the door to flip burgers. And parts of our industry are paying 10 times that to get people to their sites. Perhaps that's not surprising based on recent modeling, which showed that the construction industry in Australia needs 40,000 new workers, and the resource industry at least 15,000 new workers by 2024. The Fed, which in large part was the cause of this outcome, has now declared inflation as public enemy number one. Remarkably, this is hard to explain, whilst confidence in the Fed has been shaken, it does remain inexplicably strong. Investors have demonstrated this by taking the US dollar to historic highs. So fundamentally, we are trusting the institution that created this mess to resolve it. As one smart economist said, inflation is like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, you cannot get it back in. So when investors realize that the Fed and other central banks are not going to be able to fix this, they will again recognize the need for gold and turn to the insurance that gold offers. You've seen that only in the last week. The slightest hesitation by the chairman of the Fed, Jerome Powell, in his press conference in their resolve to tackle inflation, the gold price rallied $50. But the gold industry, and I recognize this, and evolution does face challenges that we have to address. 
we need to recognize that the investor base has changed. Passive or index funds have grown significantly. Momentum or quant funds are also much larger. Focus on ESG issues has increased and there are fewer gold active only funds. The result is that whilst there is a much larger pool of capital available for investment, the gold industry has much stronger competition for these dollars and we need to increasingly appeal to generalist investors who are not specialists in our field. We will only do this by demonstrating that over the long term, the rate of return that we can generate on our shareholders' capital is competitive with other sectors and worthy of allocation of those investment dollars. I do believe that with the right approach, we can do this. We also all do know that the gold industry is cyclical. Two years ago, we were at historically high valuations and now we are bumping along multi-year lows. How we manage through these current headwinds will define our future. <clears throat> at Evolution, we want to build a business that can prosper through this cycle. We have purposefully positioned Evolution for the inflationary cost, cost conditions which we are currently experiencing. A concentrated portfolio of high quality, low cost operations that are in first world jurisdictions. A strong balance sheet a focus on margin over volume, of quality over quantity, a track record of paying dividends, we've returned almost a billion dollars to investors, and organic accretive growth, and the emphasis is on accretive, that will increase our low cost production by 25% over the next two years. Having said that, we do acknowledge that we have fallen short on operational delivery over the past 12 months. Regrettably, we're unlikely to be winning Digger of the Year award this year. Uh, but we are determined to address this. Turning to sustainability. Our approach to sustainability is integrated into everything we do. This is seen through a human-centric lens which incorporates health, safety, the environment and the community, including our First Nations partners. Importantly, this approach is about the whole person, both physically and psychologically. We recognize that we as a company, like the rest of the industry, have work to do in ensuring psychological safety. In essence, for, this me for us, this means a workplace where people believe they can speak up and that is inclusive and diverse. We're at a minimum, and this is an absolute minimum, it is free of any form of bullying, prejudice, or sexual harassment. We are very pleased to be one of only three gold companies rated on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. We also hold the AA rating with MSCI and ha have the leading ratings for the environment and social elements in IWS. With a shifting ESG landscape and demand for renewables, not only have we made a commitment to net zero by 2050, but we are also looking at our mine life cycle differently. In this regard, we are very fortunate to have what I believe and a board believes is a truly unique opportunity at Mount Rawdon to create a multi-generational infrastructure asset. Our plan, which is advancing rapidly, is to convert the open pit mine into a one to two gigawatt pumped hydro facility uh, at the conclusion of mining. We are growing increasingly confident of the potential to demonstrate this as both a model mine closure, as well as creating significant value for evolution shareholders and a long-term renewable battery storage option for Queensland. It builds off the strong relationships with the community and the First Nation partners and secures jobs for the region. The value of this type of renewable storage has been demonstrated only this last week by the $320 million takeover bid for GenX Power led by one of the founders of Atlassian. In 2016, we completed one of our most innovative and value-creating transactions through the acquisition of an economic interest in Ernest Henry. When the opportunity came to earn 100% of this operation, we didn't hesitate, and in January this year, we announced that we had secured full ownership. There are two ways you can look at Ernest Henry. If you think of this as the copper as a byproduct credit, is an 80,000 ounce a year gold operation at extraordinarily low cost. Or the other way, which gives you a better sense of the scale of this mine, is on a gold equivalent basis. And looking at it through this lens, 
It produces around 350,000 ounces of gold equivalent ounces at very low cost. We acquired 100% of the asset for $1.9 billion and has already generated cash returns to us of over $1.5 billion. We're already less than $400 million away from repaying our full purchase price and we expect to still be producing very low cost ounces from Ernest Henry for a long time to come. This morning we released an updated mineral resource estimate that captured 119 new drill holes and resulted in a 28% increase in the, co in the contained copper to 1.13 million tonnes and a 24% increase in the contained ounces of gold to just over 2 million ounces. Again, if you think about this in gold equivalents, it equates to roughly 7.7 .7 million ounces of gold equivalent ounces. This upgrade, to the resource increase, this upgrade to the resource increases our confidence in the mine life extension that is currently being studied and will take the mine life out to at least 2031. But the story at Ernest Henry is not yet finished as mineralization has been intersected 300 meters vertically below this planned mine life extension area and provides further evidence to us that Ernest Henry is genuinely and truly a world-class ore body. We know that all eyes will be focused on Red Lake and next month we are really looking forward to hosting up to 30 investors and analysts at site. This will give us a great opportunity to showcase our vision for this asset. Red Lake uh, has a long and checkered history. About a decade ago, it propelled Gold Corp to want, be one of the most, actually the most valuable gold company in the world. That was largely through the discovery of the famous high grade zone, which was a remarkable 5 million ounce ore body, grading 30 to 50 grams per tonne. No, I didn't make a mistake there, 30 to 50 grams per tonne with a 250 meter strike length. The high grade zone was both the best and the worst thing that happened to Red Lake. Because this exceptional high grade concealed poor and inefficient mining practices and the small strike length led to significant underinvestment by its previous owners for a future when this bonanza grade was no longer available. By the time we acquired it in 2020, Red Lake was headed for closure. We knew that and that's why we were able to acquire this world-class endowment of 12 million ounces over a seven kilometer mineralized strike length with existing infrastructure and a skilled workforce for about $50 per resource ounce. That's incredibly cheap. For context, in terms of scale and size, if this project was in Australia, it would rank as the fourth largest gold system in our country. We have also brought a different vision to Red Lake. Rather than a very small tonnage, 800,000 tonne per annum operation dependent on the super bonanza high grade, we believe the future is in a, in a 2 million tonne per annum operation, processing what by Red Lake standards would be low grade of six grams per tonne. I think by Australian standards, six grams per tonne referenced this morning was considered high grade. And that, if you, produce two, if, you, if you process 2 million tons at 6 grams per ton, that will, that will produce over 300,000 ounces of low-cost gold over a very long mine life. The prize is big, but so is the challenge. And it has been made harder by the COVID pandemic and border closures. This impacted the first two years of our ownership, and we acknowledge that we are tracking 12 months behind our original schedule. At the same time, we're also very encouraged by progress over the last nine months since border restrictions have been lifted. Production and grade are up and costs are down. These improvements are being achieved through efficiencies on the mining side, optimization on the processing side, and a huge effort by the people on the ground at Red Lake. This financial year, we expect to build investor confidence in our strategy by increasing production by almost 40% to 160,000 ounces, and a further 25% increase the next year to 200,000 ounces. And then year after year, we expect to increase that until we have delivered on our vision of restoring this operation to a premier Canadian gold mine producing over 300,000 ounces. We are very confident we can achieve this. When we first acquired Cal in 2015 for $694 million, it had a reserve base of 1.6 million ounces and mining was scheduled to cease in 2020 
with processing of low-grade stockpiles finishing in 2024. That's only two years out. Over the seven years that we have owned this operation, it has returned $841 million, which is more than the original purchase price, and this is after significant capital investment in the operation's future. Through success with the drill bit, today Cal has 9.6 million min ounces in mineral resource, a 4.6 million ounce ore reserve, and an 18-year mine life ahead of it. Last year, we committed to a new $380 million underground mine following a discovery made by our exploration team four years earlier. Notwithstanding the inflationary cost pressures we are currently experiencing, this new mine remains on the original schedule and budget with all major contracts in place. This will grow that operation's gold production this financial year to 275,000 ounces and the following year to 320,000 ounces. That's a 40% increase over the next two years from current production levels. Last July, we announced the acquisition of Kandana in the East Kandana interests um, from Northern Star. This combined our Mangari tenements uh, and makes the ownership of that district, brings the ownership of that district for the first time under a single owner. Our Mangari mill is a modern and highly efficient mill. However, as you can see from the chart, uh, it did face a declining production profile as the high-grade Frog's Leg Mine neared depletion. On the neighboring tenements, Northern Star had been successfully operating several high-grade underground mines for many years, but it trucked its ore effectively past the Almangari Mill for processing 55 kilometers away at Kanina Bell. It was a very logical transaction for both parties, and we, Evolution, are now integrating the operation and realizing the synergies available to us. That's notwithstanding the labor market conditions in Western Australia that have been challenging and disruptive. A plant expansion to doubling the capacity of the plant would unlock, uh, unlock a large part of the significant lower grade open pitable resources. And we're now completing a feasibility study on this opportunity. Completion of this study will provide us the option, subject to market conditions, to grow production to around 200,000 ounces. This slide is uh, for our non-executive director, Tommy McKeith, who we've been discussing this, Tommy, you and I, for about 20 years. Um, but as we've discussed over lots of late nights, the value of a gold company is largely determined by its mineral inventory, its resources and reserves. And that's both the quality and the quantity. Discovering more ounces that are ultimately able to be mined, processed, and converted into cash in the bank is the true test of value creation. It is core to our strategy. The most important call on any acquisition we make or grassroots discovery program we commit to is the geological call on the discovery potential. At Evolution, our track record that you can see on this slides demonstrates that we have been able to add ounces of resources to our inventory at the very low cost of $35 to $40 an ounce. I think Mark Clark referenced $250 as being the average industry uh, cost for resource ounces this morning. And our reserve additions are costing us between $50 and $55 per resource ounce. Both numbers for us are sector leading. Our commitment to exploration and geology is demonstrated by our $62 million exploration budget for this financial year. Our exploration team discovered and then grew the Cal Underground to a 2.9 million ounce resource. And recent promising results from our Q joint venture are expanding our knowledge of this mineral system, which we hope to position as a future greenfields discovery in our portfolio. Above our assets and any exploration success we have, the thing which gives me the most pride about evolution is our people. We have talented people across the business and the values-driven culture which we have will always be a focus for us. We are very proud of our graduate program, which this year being the eighth year that we have run this program received more than 1,200 applicant applications for 31 positions in Australia and Canada. We were overwhelmed by the exceptional energy, talent and capacity of the individuals who applied. And we know we are absolutely training and developing the future leaders of our industry. Since we founded Evolution in 2011, we have aspired to make every person's time at our company the highlight of their career. We want everyone at Evolution to act like an owner, 
to treat the business as their own and to be an owner, which is why our many of our people own shares in our company. We purposefully structure remuneration outcomes so that our people do better when our shareholders do better. We hope we are humble in our success and that we learn from our setbacks. As the legendary Steve Jobs said, great things are never done by one person. They are done by a team of people. We are fortunate to have an exceptional team at Evolution. Thank you once again. Thanks, Canaccord. It's been a real pleasure to be here and speak to you all again in person. It's been far too long, and I'm already looking forward to Diggers and Dealers 2023. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jake. Uh, any questions from the floor? Just down here. Uh, Jake, you mentioned at the beginning that you were inflation, cost inflation proof your business. Could you give us some colour on how you go about that in simple terms? We've positioned, we've we really changed our portfolio. When we started um, in 2011, we've only got one asset left from that original portfolio. So we've sold three of our assets and the objective is always to keep improving the quality of our assets. And we have a really a different portfolio, which is lowest cost quartile, high quality um, in our business now. Any other questions? Did I hear someone out there? Oh, good. Jake, just one other question, sorry. <laughs> um, with the Mount Rawdon uh, pumped hydro development, how do you think about that in terms of your balance sheet? Is that something that stays on the books, so to speak? Do you bring in infrastructure partners, or I guess maybe that a lot of these things are still being worked through? Yeah, Duncan, we're not planning to be a power, a power generator operator, but you know the, the challenge for us is how do we maximise value for evolution shareholders? So when we started this journey and someone brought it to us three years ago and said, what about a pumped hydro mm. opportunity at Rawdon? We kind of thought, well, if we can exit with no liability to the closure, that would be a great outcome. Obviously, the last three years have seen a massive change in the debate over renewables, and we now think it could potentially be a very valuable asset. So we will, own, we will get out of the asset in terms of no liability, foreclosure, and we'll own 50% of the pumped hydro. So I think the best opportunity is for us to take it to feasibility study. Hmm. We're talking to offtake partners now, and then ultimately see how we can either give Evolution shareholders an opportunity to participate, but outside of Evolution's capital structure, mm -hmm. or to exit for Evolution value. Okay. Terrific. All right, thanks again, thanks. Jake.